Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining late in the afternoon. My name is Franck Ritin, and I'm the CIO at uh, MFM Mirante Fund Management. Uh, we are involved, as you will see, in convertible bonds, and I will present you today quantitative tools for active management of convertible bonds funds. So the agenda of the presentation will be, uh, I will talk a bit about convertible bonds at the beginning then about active management, and afterwards, at the end, show you the tool that we use for managing such strategy. Before that, very briefly, I just want to present uh, Mirante Fund Management. We have been founded in 2003 by Joe Mirante, which is there. Uh, it's today a team of 23 persons split between Zurich and Lausanne. We manage 12 investment strategies, 12 funds with a total IUM around 700 million. Our history is mostly linked uh, to convertible bonds. So, what is a convertible bond or what is the universe we are living in? Uh, this is a picture of the universe. You have the on the X axis, uh, X uh, on the horizontal. Uh, axis, you have the, the parity, so the, basically the price of the equity, which is embedded into the option, and you have on the vertical axis the CB price. You know, if you know a little bit about converts, that CB price moves, as you can see, from a bond floor, which is written just over there, uh, to the parity, so to the movement of the equity when the option is fully in the, in the money. It's an interesting endeavor. In universe, because first it gives you some kind of convexity. We see you see it on the on the graph. I can show this. No, it doesn't work. Uh, you can see this on the graph, where basically when the price of the converts go down, it basically go down to the bond floor at a pace which is relatively slowly. And if the credit quality is strong, it should stay at the bond floor. On the other side, if the equity moves up which is a positive scenario. Of course, the convertible bonds will move with the equity at a pace which is much faster. The main driver of this universe uh, are, of course, a combination of the drivers you will find on the bond side and on the equity side. So namely, we speak about credit spread, duration, equity movement, volatility of the equity, Convexity for the whole universe, we can handle that. Uh, liquidity is an important driver, I will come to that later. And of course, new issues that also help the universe to, to move. Here, each circle, I didn't mean it, but each circle represents one convert. And the size of the circle, the radius, is basically the weight of these convertible bonds within the universe. One thing that is interesting in this universe, in these asset classes, is the similarity. You have here a graph that shows you the similarity of two indices within the bond universe, uh, namely the global focus and the global focus investment grade. Global focus is a universe which focuses on the converts that are most convex, and uh, global focus investment grade focuses on the converts that are convex and, moreover, have a strong uh, credit quality. We will focus on the orange line, which is a global focus, a wider universe, uh, and took the point in August 21, if you can see it, you s it, uh, it indicates basically that we have a 30% similarity uh, back 12 months ago. So if, you, if we were in August 21 and look back 12 months, basically you will find only 30% of the instruments within the universe which are the same. So it means that the universe is moving a lot. There is a lot of instruments going out of the universe, a lot of instruments com coming in. For example, to give a to give a comparison, the S&P this year, it's only eight movements. So there is four equities that enter the S&P 500, sorry, and uh, four equities that exit the S&P 500. So the similarity is much lower. And basically, this shows you why this universe is moving so much, or how it's moving so much, and it also explains you why we talk about active management. It's really complicated to have a passive strategy in a new universe that is moving so much. The other feature that are, is quite interesting about convertible bonds and the convertible universe is the fact that we can evaluate the valuation from a theoretical point of view. So basically, we mix uh, the bond side and the equity side. And you have here 
the, the pricing components of the whole universe, of the global focus in this case. So you see that the biggest trunk is the bond floor. So basically, if the option is not valid, it doesn't bring you anything, you have at least the valuation of the straight bonds of the issuer with same maturity. It's a big part of uh, the valorization. You have the equity components, which is much smaller. This is a, the components of the valuation. So in terms of contribution to the performance, of course, the equity components, when equity goes up a lot, the contribution will be much higher because equity moves much more than, than bonds, uh, as you know. But in terms of valorization, this is what we have. And the third component of the valorization of this theoretical uh, convertible bonds is the cheapness. And cheapness is basically the difference between the market price and your the theoretical price. So if you take the bond components, the equity components, you mix that together, you have a theoretical value. Then you go to market and try to exchange or buy or sell your convert. Of course, uh, it won't be the same price. And basically, this cheapness it represents the supply and demand within the, within the universe. Usually, as you have seen, on the whole universe, you have a discount to buy your convertible bonds. This is due to the fact that you issuers that come to the market to issue new, bond, new converts uh, like it because it's not so much costly, it goes very fast, so it's much faster than straight bonds. And so they, they like convert for that. On the other side, of course, they need to give something to have these benefits, and basically the benefits for the investor is to have a small discount on the theoretical price. So this is what you've seen on the previous slide, that usually the cheapness is is positive for the investor. It's a bit cheaper than, uh, than we, what we can compute theoretically. Here you have the cheapness, only the cheapness, about the four region. This is a graph that is computed by uh, the assumption of, uh, of Jeffries. And you see, for example, that the orange line is uh, Asia's cheapness. You see that this is an underlying, uh, uh, an underlying, but uh, basically Asia has been always cheaper than the rest of the world, due to the fact that most of the US arbitrageurs try to edge their position, but it's more difficult in Asia. And basically, it generates less demand for this type of converts, and therefore the cheapness is much stronger. On the contrary, if we look at uh, US, which is a purple line, you see that the over uh, around the zero line, which is basically the, the fair value of the real theoretical value, because they will arbitrage this much faster in the US than in the Asia. So, yep, of course. If something is, so, is cheaper than the theoretical value for such a long time as Asian bonds, or the Asian CD, might it be true that the model is wrong? No, I don't think so, because the model, in, so the theoretical price, as I say, embed the, the fixed income value, the bonds, and the equity. This is something that you could calculate. This is uh, computed with various models, but the models are not wrong for this part. The question that you ask is about the cheapness. Why the cheapness is so strong? And basically, these two parts I've mentioned doesn't explain the whole movement of price, because the most important one there is liquidity. So if you get back to 2008, you have a theoretical value for your convert, but you can trade it. There is no liquidity at all. And therefore, the the value of your bonds go to zero. So it's not that the model is wrong, it's just that the liquidity that you have on this uh, universe, you need to take it into account into your valuation. And this is something that is a bit weird because it's really supply and demand and we can't really explain how it moves, but it's not wrong, it's just the, what we measure in terms of, of pricing. It's not related to the spread. It's, there is some correlation, I would say, uh, but it's not directly correlated to the spread. It's really correlated to the supply and demand. You can imagine that there is a huge uh, problem on one country, which has a high credit quality for the companies that are issuing convertible bonds, then your cheapness will, go, will be very strong in terms of pricing, because the liquidity will make it much cheaper. And this is what we see during, during crisis, for example, uh, Look at the orange line recently. So if you come start of the year, last six months, you, you see that the cheapness has increased a lot. It has become more and more cheap. And this is basically because China started to look at a growth company. New issue in China have slowed a lot because companies will say, okay, we will wait for the government to, 
to, to uh, attack the big names, but we won't issue new bonds. And then, therefore, the consequences was the fact that the cheapness become much stronger, not really on the credit spread. So it's, it's related somehow, but, but not directly. So in terms of investment philosophy, I don't want to talk too much about what you are doing, but what we are doing uh, at MFM, but 2003, start of the, of the company, Joe Mirante set up the MFM Global Convertible Defensive, and so within the universe I describe you, the idea was really to provide to investors a uh, strategy that focus on the bond floor. So what we want with this strategy, if, if there is any pressure on credit spread, we want the bond floor to stay put. And therefore, we go for high credit quality in terms of companies, and we go, therefore, for investment grade. This has impacted, and I will talk it about that later, uh, it has an impact on the allocation, but this is a most conservative approach. And again, the target is really to be strong during the crisis when the credit spread will be under, uh, under pressure. Second strategy is called the MFM Global Convertible Opportunities. This strategy has two lives, starting 2008 to 2015, and then since 2015, it's a bit more dynamic approach, and there we focus mainly about the convexity. So we don't care so much about the credit quality. We want to find the driver of performance of the universe in all the directions, so not only in the direction of the bond floor, but really all the direction, and therefore it's a bit more uh, dynamic strategy. That being said, the strategy is investment grade since 2015, and we remain investment grade even today. I've talked about convertible bonds, now I will talk a little bit about active management. So I told you with the universe that is moving so much, with the fact that we can compute a valuation with the, the theoretical valuation, we, we think it's a good idea to manage this, uh, this universe with an, an active management uh, process. So basically, active management for us, it's separated in three blocks. So first, you define the strategy. I told you the defensive. We focus on the bond floor. We high credit quality. Uh, opportunities, we focus on different satellites of performance. So defining the strategy, and then we need to uh, implement it. Implement it, it means construct the portfolio, optimize the allocation in terms of region, in terms of sector, risk factors, whatever, uh, and then make the selection. Selection is an important part in the process because for convertible bonds, today I will talk a lot about allocation and positioning of strategy, but it remains also uh, management which is bottom-up. So at the end of the day, you still need to go to one instrument, look at all the details, see if you can trade the instrument, if the liquidity is sufficient, and then include it into the, into the strategy. So implementing, optimizing the strategy, then you execute trading. It's still a TC market, so we need to do the trade. It's not automatic uh, yet and won't be in the next, uh, I will say, years. Uh, so trading, rebalancing, profit-taking, currency hedging, all strategies are our edge, and optimizing as much as we can the, the cost. This is also an important piece. I won't talk about that today. Uh, this is something that we do since a long time, and I think we are quite good in the execution part. Evaluating the strategy when you have set up the fund, you have trade, you have launched the strategy, then on a continuous basis, we need to be able to analyze the performance. And the idea is really to be sure that what we have set up in terms of portfolio positioning is performing like we thought it, it was. And basically, it means that we need to be able to measure the performance really precisely, which is a bit complicated for converts because there is a lot of driver, as I showed you before, and to have a very precise and consistent attribution of performance. And then the last step, and this is the one that I will show you today, is stress testing. When you have the strategy, you have been able to measure what happens on your strategy compared to the universe. The idea is to stress test your strategy today to see what could happen in the future. So now I will go to the, to the tool. So since almost three years now, we have started to develop an in-house tool to measure the performance and to be able to do what I've just explained, to be able to manage actively uh, the strategy. So why we decided to go for an in-house database? First, it's quite low cost, I would say because today we have a very powerful tool to set that up. We still need to have the data, we'll come to, to that later, but uh, setting up with Python, with the database tools that we have, is relative, relatively low cost. It should allow us to continuously 
manage the assumption, so to focus on the change of the assumption, because the universe, as I said, has many drivers, and they move all together. And as the universe is more over changing all the time, as I show you, uh, it's quite complicated to be sure where we are at a current, uh, at a current level. So continuously uh, managing the assumption, and same is true for the universe itself, as uh, is moving so much. The objective was to have a precise performance attribution, to be able to compare to the universe, to the other asset classes, and also to some, to some peers. Uh, why we go in the cloud? We decided to go to the Google Cloud. Uh, it was a decision. The other class were quite, quite good too. There is not a lot of difference, but we think that for uh, this uh, use, for this database, it was, uh, it was the best one. The idea was also to leverage the statistic analytics that we can have directly within the cloud platform. So there is a lot of libraries that are available that we will be able to plug directly towards our database and in the more long term uh, to be able to apply even artificial intelligence approaches just to test strategies. Uh, for the moment, we are uh, working with EPFL in Lausanne to test visualization tools to see the universe. I try to show you some stuff, but as you see, it's not, uh, it's not completely easy to, to to show what really is happening within this universe, because there is so many, of course, dimensions. And finally, the security of the Google uh, Cloud was, seems for us uh, largely sufficient and, and very good. Before that, what we need to be done is, of course, to construct the database, and for that, we need to have a clear and consistent data. Uh, the roadmap, I won't take too much time on this slide, but the idea is that we receive every day a lot of data. We receive data from external providers like brokers. We have the data from Jeffries, from Nomura. Uh, we have data from Thomson Reuters for the indices. Reprisk for the ESG part, for the sustainability uh, ranking. We, we use Reprisk, which is a Zurich-based company. Uh, the fund provider, we work with, uh, with FPS, so all the data about the portfolio come every morning, some data from Bloomberg, and also, of course, the data from MFM that we use as assumptions to modelize in a sense the universe. Everything, it corresponds to 50 to 100 files per day that arrive to, to, to us, and they are automatically treated, computed, and uploaded into the, into the database. And then, of course, with this database, we could do extraction. We generate a lot of emails, uh, daily emails to the PM to be able to monitor what I've just mentioned in all dimensions. And finally, we have the front end, which is basically what I will show you. There are web pages where we can analyze and try to stress test the, the strategy. So therefore, I will quit my PowerPoint presentation if I can, and move directly to the, to the internet. So this is, a, this is just a browser, so I access the database for a web browser. This is the tool that we use on a daily basis to manage uh, the strategies. I will show you some of them. I won't explain everything because there is a lot of data and a lot of ID behind, but just to give you, give you a flower of what, uh, what we are doing uh, with this. So this is the first dashboard that, uh, that we have. It's for the positioning of the strategy. You are is basically the allocation, very classical. Uh, very classical tool, this is not the right one, this is the allocation. I put it by sector and region, and so we see how we are allocated. Of course, you can compare the allocation to a given universe. This is for our defensive strategy, so the universe we take is a global focus investment grade, uh, and you see that on the previous slide, the Absolute allocation, for example, to Western Europe was 50%, which we are still underweight compared to the universe, 8%. So this is really basic, but it gives us uh, the current positioning. I talk about the impact of the investment grade before. I, I just get back to this one. So you see that deciding to go for investment grade and to very high qu credit quality, uh, it induced a bias towards the strategy. So it means that we are more weight linked to Europe, almost 50%, compared to the rest of the world, where we are approximately equally split between US and uh, Asia X. With this dashboard, of course, the objective uh, was to go to the performance, we can choose, of course, all the period that you want, but here you have the performance of the strategy on a year-to-date basis, complicated year for, 
I think, all asset classes, but also for, for converts. You see the contribution of each part and each uh, region and sector within this, this allocation. And of course, for us, what is interesting is also the relative contribution to the performance compared to the index. Uh, in this case, you see that we generate 1% more than the index, and you see where basically it comes from. You can go more deeper, of course, uh, until the line uh, details, so to see every bond, the behavior that they have, if we have it in the universe or not. So this is the tool we use. I didn't show you before, but the, the, the center of the database is the, is the assumption. So here you have just an illustration of what we do, for example, for credit spread. So we collect all the credits, or not all the credit spread, but in this case, from Jeffries and Refinitiv. We have the one from Nomura also soon. And uh, at the same time, we compare to our uh, credit spread. Then we have a lot of data about credit spread, and what is interesting is to see if there is a movement within credit spread uh, on the broker side, and try to, to, to understand why or towards Refinitiv, which are doing the indices. And if you want to do performance attribution, you need to know the assumption about the indices too. And this is basically what we monitor uh, with, with this. So we have that for all the assumption of the, of the universe. And of course, on, afterwards, what we can do is we can lo look at the performance breakdown by assumption. So if I go to credit spread, you will have the same type of a graph, but for credit spread. So we can compare where we are in terms of credit spread and what the contribution to the overall credit spread we have in the strategy. So this is for, the, for this. I'll move now to the, uh, what we call the convertible bonds stats. Uh, this is a bit small. I know you can read, but I will explain uh, you. So present is here. So the idea of this tool is really to compare the positioning of the strategy currently and in the past, as you will see, uh, with any sub part, subset of the universe. And the idea is that we try in most of our in the two strategies to optimize the convexity, but we can compute a lot of, of statistics about the behavior and the positioning of the, of the strategy. And so it was important for us to be able really to, to, to look at any part of the universe. And this is basically what these uh, tools allow us to do. So you can choose the strategy or the index. You can choose, I take opportunities, there is a bit more of an instrument within the, the strategy, and I take the global focus, which is this reference index. And basically, again, you have the, the parity in the X uh, axis and the CB price on the Y, and all the circle are the instrument. And then on the left-hand side, you have all the statistics that is about this universe. You have four columns because what we can do is to keep here the statistics for the whole strategy, and then we can dig a little bit further within the universe uh, by screening different elements. So I just show you, for example, if we want to go to the US, I say, okay, the positioning in the US will be there. There we keep only the, the US name, and if we want to go, for example, to information technology, this is what you have. Then we can go further by selecting one, and you will know which converts it is. It's statistic associated. But the most important one is really the positioning that we have there, to see if the convexity is the same. If it's not the same, will it on will, or do we need to change, and so on. And this we do looking at all the statistics. If there are differences, we want to understand why, and we want to know what will be the impact in terms of performance. The most interesting part for me is this one. Uh, Perhaps before, yeah. the most interesting part for me is really this one. I don't know if you can read that, but there basically you have the main assumption of the behavior of a convertible bonds universe. And basically, as we have the data in the whole universe, we are able to compute stress test. So the idea is, for example, I will tell you, but for equity, if we stress test equity, so we don't change anything else, just keep all the same assumption, but just move on equity, a 25 movement of equity will generate a performance of minus 9.76, and a positive movement of 25% on the equities will generate a performance of 11.86. Uh, it shows you the convexity, but for us, it's interesting to dig further and then to, to go on 
smaller part of the universe and see if the positioning is still valid and this is still what we, what we want to, to achieve. Interesting part also with this tool, I'll go back to the US, so there's a bit more of positioning, is that we can get back in history and basically look at the behavior dynamically from the, from the portfolio compared to any universe. And this is basically that you have. The jumps are around five, five to four days. And you see the change. And you see also, you, I let you imagine the change on the stress test. So you, you see that in live. And this is something we monitor continuously. So this is for the, for the tool, for the screening tool. Uh, and this is something we use continuously to really screen if we want to increase our exposure towards one region, one sector, one sub-industry, then we will look at that, we look at the universe, what it offers, and if it adds to the strategy or not from a disaggregate perspective, so very small, to the, to the whole universe. I will stop there. Then, of course, with, as soon as we have uploaded all the data, we can do a lot of other things. Uh, for example, we can monitor the positioning of the strategy in terms of ESG. We have integrated ESG a few years ago within the, the convert, but also within the other strategies that we are managing. And basically, it's quite straightforward to have a monitoring tool showing you uh, where you have risk to exposure towards ESG issue. Here, I've shown you the exposure towards the United Nation Global Compact 10 principle of sustainability. So it's basically show you how much of the instrument you have in the universe is at risk or at potential risk to breach one of these rules. And we do that for the various uh, aspects of our ESG strategy. A byproduct, which is also quite interesting coming from the database, is that we can generate fact sheets. Again, it's very small for you, but you have here a web page which is basically a PDF when you download it, which is the fact sheet in a daily basis with all the statistics you've just seen. And then, of course, all the performances analysis that we have within uh, what we call our chart pack that analyze the performance on all directions with all peers and all potential and existing indices that we have been able to, to upload. I go back to the presentation. So just one word I wanted to present about uh, the tools, just one, one or two slides about the current environment, what happens with interest rate going up, very high inflation. We have looked at historical data with, uh, with the quant team. This is for US, we didn't want to, to mix uh, the currencies, so to have really pure data for the behavior of the universe uh, during such, uh, such events. So basically, in, uh, in blue, you have the, you have the rate. Uh, in orange, we have the in blue. Sorry, you have the fund target rate. In orange, you have the rate, and you have the core inflation in uh, green. And we have uh, identified period where interest rates were going up, just to analyze what well, has been the impact on the on the converts. One interesting thing on this graph is the gray line, and I think this will be the most important driver for us and for most investors uh, in terms of allocation, is the EPS growth during this period. And so you see that in the period, unfortunately, we don't have all the data, uh, but only since 1999, but you see that usually in period of raising interest rates, the US EPS has grown, which explains surely why the performance has been quite strong on the equity. The big question we have today is what will arrive in the next months. Will the EPS of the companies in the current environment, which is not exactly the same of this one, of course, uh, will still be strong enough? If we analyze the performance of, of that, you see that the CBs, as the theory will predict, behave quite well. They have performed very well in such an environment. The idea, roughly speaking, is that the contribution of the performance on the bond side, which is rather negative at the beginning of the interest rate pickup, is completely compensated by the contribution of the equity side, which again is moving its much wider, uh, much wider length. And it explains why the performance has been always 
positive for CBs. If you look at Europe, you will have the same type of graph. I go directly to the table, and you will see that here it's even better because there are two periods within the history where the euro stock was negative, but still within this period, convertible bonds have benefited from that because they don't were so much impacted due to the bond floor, but benefited from the strong performance at the end of the period of the, of the bond. So even in period where it's negative for equity, converts have been more or less positive. It's not great, but it has been at least positive. So this is why we think that convertible bonds should behave quite well. We will continue to focus for the time being on the convexity, try to position the strategy as much as we can to be convex, to really benefit if there is any rebound of markets strongly with with, uh, within our, our portfolio, and of course to remain quite uh, high in terms of quality. In terms of conclusion, just want to show you the team. I want to thank Jordan, which is just there, uh, which is part of the quantitative team. I work a lot uh, to develop the tool you, you've seen. And the other one is Sylvain Etier, which, uh, which is in Lausanne today. Uh, last slide, uh, which is a bit marketing, not only for our strategy, but I think for the, for the whole asset class. This is a performance since 2003 of uh, the MFM Global Defensive. Uh, bond fund compared to the MSCI world, to the global Barclays, global aggregate corporate, so the whole universe of, of corporate of corporate bonds, and the, the indices. And if you look, I know it's tough to read, but if you look at the sharp ratio since 2003, the convertible bond strategy has generated the sharp ratio of 0 0.6. If you look at the MSCI world, the sharp ratio is 0 0.39, so it's much better in terms of sharp, not in terms of performance, but in terms of sharp. Same is true for the global aggregate. Sharp ratio is 0 0.45. Then if we go to the index that we use as a reference within the convertible bonds, the sharp ratio has been 20, 0 0.22, so we generate a lot of alpha adjusted to risk in this universe, and it's even true compared to the MSCI world and the global aggregate which means that at least if you allocate a bit of uh, your risk towards convertible bonds in terms of pure risk allocation, it seems historically, at least since 2003, to work quite well. So thank you for your attention. I don't want to go too much into the conclusion. I will let time for one or two questions if there are. I think I show you uh, what we are doing with our cloud-based database tool. It will really improve, and we are sure it improves our way of managing convertible bonds, and the more we use it, the more we learn about the, the behavior of this universe, and how we can position within this universe of strategy. Uh, we have an experienced team since 2003 where we are there managing this strategy with the same target. It hasn't changed. We, we improve the tools that we use to manage, but the strategy remains the same. Focus on convexity and limiting the drawdown. I thank you for your attention. Before the question, I just pass an invitation after the presentation. We'll be really happy to have you on our booth. We'll have a little apero for the end of the message, so don't hesitate to, to come by uh, at booth number 05. It's just at the entrance of the, of the message.